Welcome to video 3 for week 11. In the previous video, I introduced Leslie matrices as an example of a dynamical system so that we actually talk about something relatively concrete. In the last two videos for this week, I want to talk about Markov chains, which is another type of dynamical system. Video 3 will be a little bit abstract again, and then video 4 I'll try and get a little bit more concrete with a very specific example. So these dynamical systems deal with probability situations, and I'm going to express this probability situation in a graph. I have a number of vertices, and the vertices are the states I can be in, in whatever my situation is, and I have probabilities of transferring from one state to the next in a certain time step. So I have state 1, and I have a 20% chance of staying in state 1, I have a 40% chance of going to state 2, I have a 40% chance of going to state 3. And notice that these outgoing arrows add up to a probability of 1, so that if I'm in state 1, I go somewhere with probability 1. 20% here, 40% here, 40% here, that adds up to probability 1. If I'm in state 2, again I have a 20% chance of staying here, I have a 50% chance of going to state 1, and I have a 30% chance of going to state 3. Again, those add up to a probability of 1. And in state 3, I have a 40% chance of staying there, a 40% chance of going to state 2, and a 20% chance of going to state 1. So in each state, in each vertex, the outgoing probabilities add up to 1. The ingoing probabilities don't need to, so the ingoing probabilities here are 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, add up to 0.9, and that's fine. The ingoing probabilities don't need to be 1, but I need the outgoing probabilities to add to 1 so that I know when I'm starting in a particular state that there is something to do with probability 1. All right, I'm going to translate this into a matrix action. So the matrix I'm going to get has all of those nine coefficients. Each column is going to be the outgoing probabilities from a certain vertex. So the outgoing probabilities from vertex 1 are, is column 1. The outgoing probabilities from vertex 2 is column 2. The outgoing probabilities from vertex 3 is column 3. So for the same reason, that means that the columns of this matrix need to add up to 1. And you can check that all of these columns, in fact, do that. From vertex 1, there's a 20% chance I stay where I am a 40% chance I go to vertex 2, which will end up be part of this, and a 40% chance I go to vertex 3, which will end up being part of this coefficient. Likewise, 20% chance of staying in vertex 3, 40% chance, or 2, 40% chance of staying in vertex 3, and the other transmission coefficients between the various vertices of this graph. Let's look at what happens when I start acting on a initial condition. So here I am starting in vertex 2 with probability 1. So I know I'm exactly in vertex 2. What happens if I keep acting on this system? So after one time step, I have a 50% chance to be in vertex 1, only a 20% chance to be still in vertex 2, and a 30% chance to be in vertex 3. If I act again, I get this. If I act again, I get this. If I act again, I get this. If I've acted five ten times, I get these probabilities. Starting in vertex 2, after five time steps, I have a 30% roughly chance to be in vertex 1, 33.3% chance roughly to be in vertex 2, and a 36.7% chance roughly to be in vertex 3. And you can see that these are, look like they're sort of balancing out. They're sort of balancing out to a stable set of probabilities. So let's talk about the general behavior and the definitions. A probability vector is a vector where the entries of the vector add up to 1. So the starting state likewise needs to be a probability vector. I could be 50% chance in state 1 or 2, but 0.5 plus 0.5 equals 1. This gives me a probability vector, also called a stochastic vector. A stochastic matrix is a matrix like the one on the previous page, where all the columns add to 1 for the same probability reasons. And it's a very nice theorem that if a stochastic matrix acts on a stochastic vector, the output is still a stochastic vector. So probability interpretation is preserved under the action of this matrix. So if I take a stochastic matrix and my starting vectors are stochastic vectors, the dynamical system that results is called a Markov chain. And that's what I want to analyze in this video and in video four for this week. So if I have an irreducible stochastic matrix, the dominant eigenvalue is always going to be 1, and that's because I have a probability situation. I, I can't have exponential growth or exponential decay here because that would mess with an interpretation that everything needs to add up to 1 in order for it to be a valid probability situation. So there's a theorem you can prove that shows that these really are the right matrices to analyze probabilities. The dominant eigenvalue is always 1. 
Well, that means we don't get a lot out of calculating the eigenvalue because we already know what it is. But it is going to give us a steady state. And that steady state is going to be the interesting thing. It's going to give us the interpretation of what's going on with the long-term probabilities. All other eigenvalues decay. So in the long term, only the eigenvector that matches this dominant eigenvalue gives us the long term probabilities. So unlike Leslie matrices, where the eigenvalue is the important thing, here we want to calculate the eigenvector that matches to eigenvalue 1, and the entries of that eigenvector are going to give us the long term probabilities. So here is another graph on three vertices. I've changed the numbers this time. Um, from vertex 1, I have a 0% chance of staying there a 3% chance of going to vertex 2 and a or a 30% chance of going to vertex 2 and a 70% chance of going to vertex 3. Likewise, there are some other numbers. That gives me this matrix. And again, all I'm going to calculate here is now the eigenvector. This is the eigenvector that matches with the eigenvalue 1. The computer gave me a vector which scales so that it had one in the last component, but that's not a probability vector. So what I did was I rescaled it, so I just added up all the coefficients and divided by that scalar to give me a probability vector. My eigenvector can be scaled however I want, so I can always scale it such that its coefficients add to one. If you add these three numbers up, you will get exactly one. So what what we want to do for these Markov chains, for these stochastic matrices, is we want to calculate the eigenvector that matches the eigenvalue 1, and then we want to scale it so that it's actually a probability vector, a stochastic vector. And this tells us that the long-term behavior is going to approach this probability vector. That means that the long-term behavior of ending up in vertex 1 is 45.2%. These are all approximate values, of course. The long-term probability of ending up vertex 2 is only 13.6%, and the long-term probability of ending up at vertex 3 is 41.2%. And if I go back, it makes sense that the probability of vertex 2 is pretty low, because I can't stay there. There's no transmission from vertex 3, and there's only a 3% transmission from vertex 1. So the incoming probabilities to, to vertex 2 are actually pretty low. So that is reflected in the fact that in the long run, it's actually pretty unlikely that I end up in that vertex. It's much more likely that I end up in the other two vertices. Let me do one more example now with five vertices. You can check if you want that all of the outgoing probabilities in each of these vertices add to one. If I look at three, I have 20% here and 80% here, 0.2 and 0.8 add up to one. If I look at five, I have 50% there, 40% there, 10% there. Those three outgoing arrows always add up to one. This is going to be true for all of the vertices. Not all of the vertices have connections, so I'm going to assume that if there is no connection, for example, if there's no connection from three to one uh, in this direction, that that probability is zero. So if I change that into a matrix, take all of these coefficients and add the zeros where necessary, I get this five by five matrix, which represents the probability graph on the previous slide. I ask the computer for the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 1, and then I scaled it so that it was a probability vector, so that these five things, if you add them up, you could get exactly 1. And I interpret that as the long-term probabilities. I have a 26.1 approximately probability of ending in vertex 1, and likewise the probability of ending in the other vertices. I see a very low number for vertex 3. If I look back here, there's only one arrow pointing to vertex 3, and it's a pretty low probability. So I can't even get there from 2, 1, or 5, or from 3 itself. I can only get there from 4 with a low probability. So it makes sense that the long-term probability of ending up in vertex 3 is quite low. Vertex 2 has a very high probability. Well, I have lots of ingoing er arrows. I have 80% 80, 80 here, 50% here, 60% here, 30% of stay in there. So there's lots of ways with high probabilities to get to vertex 2. So it makes sense that vertex 2 has a high long-term probability. So those are some examples of Markov chains. This video, like the first one, is a little bit abstract. I've talked about probabilities, but haven't specialized to what these probabilities are. What am I actually measuring? I'm going to finish this week in the next video, in video 4, by talking about some specific probabilities in a particular instance to make this a little bit more concrete.